Augusta, sweet Augusta on my mind. Your dog would say you was Hello everybody, wherever you are around the world. Welcome to Golf Connections once again. I'm Mitch Lawrence. Happy to have you with us here on the Golf Director. Dot com wrapping up a month of masters presented by East Coast Golf Management and in association with the Myrtle Beach Golf app and bogeyteaseoff.com and our thanks to the great Dottie Pepper for her work with Bogey. Uh, also thanks as we begin this final show of a month of masters uh, to Billy Mack, the one and only Billy Mack. We have started every month of masters show with Augusta Sweet Augusta and I can only tell you that after returning from Augusta and a great event last week at the Masters. Uh, the song touches me even more deeply this time than it normally does, and it always does. So thanks again, Billy Mack, for all that great work. And what a week it was. The 2014 Masters wrapped up. Um, it began with a what I think was really, really uh, something that will be looked at as an iconic moment in golf. I know that's a strong statement, but the drive, chip, and putt contest on Sunday morning uh, had me glued to the TV, and I hope a lot of other people were as well. What that brought to Augusta National, to the world of junior golf, to the first tee, to just so many things. Uh, it was an absolutely wonderful way to start the week. Uh, and I really think that it kind of ended on Sunday evening with a two-time Masters champion who plays the game like a kid. And uh, I think many people relate to it. I think that's one of the reasons why Bubba Watson, uh, this time, he has before, but I think this time he captured people's imagination in, in an even different way. And it was great, great to watch. Fantastic theater as always. Uh, we're going to talk about that and a lot more with my guest today as we close the book on the Masters. I am thrilled to have him with us. Jim Nugent, the founder and publisher of the brilliant, beautifully executed e-magazine, The Global Golf Post, which for those of us who are uh, devout readers, uh, I'll use a couple of religious terms here, uh, devout, it is indeed for me a religious experience, I think for other people of sorts. Some people choose to go to church on Sunday morning, uh, or they worship the way they want, uh, but my experience comes on Monday morning, a mere 12 hours after the last putt drops, somehow in this great age of technology, in my inbox on Monday morning, is the Global Golf Post. And uh, I, there is not a better wrap-up to what has happened, not just in the world um, of the pro tours around the world, all of them, but the amateur game, the junior game, uh, all the information that you really need to know in what seems to me a perfect space, exactly the right amount of coverage uh, so that you can get through it, you can begin the day reading some of the great writers that we have in the game. Um, and in the case of the Masters, a lot of the majors and other special weeks, there is a daily Global Golf Post, uh, and I look forward to that every morning. Just a fantastic, fantastic addition to the game of golf in this new world that we have. And uh, I and so many others are particularly grateful to my guest Jim Nugent for, for starting what has become... Um, just such a great habit for all of us who love the game. I'm anxious to get his take on the Masters, on all the stories there, and we'll uh, touch on the beginnings of Global Golf Post after that. Uh, welcome to Golf Connections and a month of Masters. I'm happy to have you here to wrap it all up for us, Jim Nugent. Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for having me on, but more importantly, thank you so very much for your kind words about uh, uh, what we do at Global Golf Post. We, we work very, very hard to uh, bring to golfers the, our end of news and information, and you're very kind to recognize that, and I, I thank you for it. You are more than welcome. It is we who thank you. <laughs> um, it, obviously, a ton already been written um, and said about the week. I, I know you were in Augusta. I saw you there. I'm, I'm anxious to get your take just kind of off the top um, about what you felt coming in and then what you took away from it, what you got coming out of it, because it was kind of a different event. I don't think the back nine on Sunday had the drama that people really kind of always hope for in a way, but it had a very special kind of otherworldly quality to me, and I'm anxious to hear what you thought about the week. Well, it was a different week to be sure, and it was a different work, uh, week for all of us as we uh, gathered in Augusta because it was the first time 
uh, in a very long time that Tiger Woods wasn't going to be a part of uh, the Masters. And so I'm not sure what anybody uh, really uh, knew to expect as the week gone. I find it interesting uh, bookends. Uh, if you watched uh, the kids on Sunday, and I think you're, you're spot on, something very important happened on, on that Sunday. Uh, Bubba Wood, uh, Bubba uh, announced himself by, uh, leaving his hotel room and, and coming out and uh, unscripted participating in uh, the drive, chip, and putt uh, circumstances. And then one week later, uh, he wrapped up the week by donning the, the green jacket uh, for the second time. So there was some symmetry to Bubba Watson last week at Augusta National. Um, I love that Adam Scott also came out. Uh, I, was, I was so impressed by the fact that both of them were kind of watching in their hotel room and they said, we've got to be out there. And, and it, it added such a... Uh, you know, the quality of genuineness as far as starting the week that way was really amazing to me. Really, really You cool. know, it was, a, it was a, uh, a great idea, brilliantly executed by uh, Chairman Payne and the members of Augusta National. Uh, it, was, it was a very, very important moment in the development of uh, our game around the world. And I think, uh, I'm not sure that everybody has fully grasped uh, the implications of it, but it was... Uh, uh, a spectacular uh, uh, idea and a great day at Augusta. We, uh, I was fortunate enough to do uh, to be at the Monday after the Masters yesterday, which is held here in Myrtle Beach, as you know. And I was talking to Charlie Reimer about it, who was integral to the coverage uh, that was done by the Golf Channel, and he had a lot of stories about what it was like putting together the programming because it was it was five hours basically of coverage. So there was a lot of unknown going into it about how it would come off, how it would be put together, and uh, I think everybody I know he was he I asked him what his favorite part of the week was, and without hesitation. He literally just looked at me and said, the drive, chip, and putt. It, he didn't even, there was no hesitation at all. He said it was so fantastic to watch. Everybody wanted it to come off well, and obviously it did do that. So hope for all of us who love and, and work on the game or around the game, I think what you say is true, which is the, the impact of it has yet to be felt. I'm looking for an amazing increase in number of kids whose parents are going to get them involved this year to try to get them to Augusta, even if it's so the parents can go with them. <laughs> I, I heard some number that already for next year's uh, event, so 362 or 354 days from now, whatever it is, that they already have approaching 20,000 kids who have signed up at the website to participate. And they had 17,000 last year, all year. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, great. Well, I, I know that they're going to even do more next year. Um, as far as the, uh, you know, when you watched it, uh, the coverage of it, and we saw, you know, there were a number of great storylines, and I know the team that you have put together at Global Golf Post, uh, when we were talking a little bit earlier, you gave them due credit, and obviously we all agree. But the idea of being able to concentrate on certain storylines uh, in a really, really quick fashion. I mean, the daily coverage has to, has to capture those storylines quickly and daily. And then the wrap-up edition, which we all got yesterday... You know, to pick out the uh, the storylines that happened during the week. I mean, obviously Bubba winning the second time and what surrounded that. Uh, Jordan Spieth, I know that you said that, that Jordan is somebody who moves the needle as far as Global Golf Post. And I know this is probably true for a lot of other outlets now, but for Global Golf Post, he is somebody who is already a 20 years old, um, a needle mover. There's, there's something about this young man, and I, I can't quite put my finger on it, and I, I, in fairness, I need to point out that I, I kind of watched him grow up through the American Junior Golf Association, where I've been on the board for some 20 years. Uh, but even, even still, even despite that, uh, I can't quite put my finger on it, but this kid is, is very special. And it's, it, it's, it's for his talent, to be sure, but I think it's also for his youthful innocence. Uh, I think in the Tiger era, we kind of forgot about youthful innocence. We forgot about playing the game for fun. And I think this kid has unconsciously tapped into that emotion. And here's hoping that he never loses it, including some of the emotion that he showed from time to time on the backside. That was refreshing. We all react like that on the golf course when we hit a bad shot. 
Well, what's funny is to hear different people's reaction because on the one hand, as you said, he's 20 years old. Uh, you know, instead of being a sophomore uh, in college, he's in the final pairing at Augusta on Sunday. Uh, so some people expect so much out of him already. And then there's the other side of it, which is you literally have to remind yourself of the fact that there's growth to be had and there's a lesson to be learned and, and all the things that we talk about. Um, you know, and he is a perfect example of all of it other than this otherworldly sense of maturity that he seems to have relative not just to the game but to dealing with, you know, if you watch the interview that uh, Tom Rinaldi did with him after the, after the round, even the way he was able to maintain himself and, and articulate the fact that it was fun, it was a great experience, but how much it hurt, you know, it was a really amazing thing to watch him be that composed in that moment right after the round. I thought the same thing, and I also, I, I saw something that was, uh, didn't go unnoticed uh, by some. Uh, he, he very wisely, very maturely did not walk onto the green to shake um, Bubba's hand immediately. He saw that Bubba was going to move to his caddy, embrace his caddy. We all know that Bubba is a, an emotional guy. Uh, rather than step in the middle of it, rather than kind of hog the scenery, he waited his moment until uh, Bubba had uh, unclenched himself and then shook hands with the champion. This, this kid's got something that you can't teach. Uh, there was somebody that I heard, and given how long you've been associated with junior golf, it could even have been you in some of my reading, but I'm sure you'll tell me if it wasn't. Somebody said that they covered a lot of junior golf and uh, for uh, media, for TV and, and different outlets, and they said that when he was 10 years old, whenever they would cover an event that Jordan Spieth was participating in, um, they would always look to him and go to him as a 10-year-old above anybody else, almost no matter where he finished, because they knew they would get a couple of things. They would get a great sound bite, and he would be the one person they could be sure would do a good job on TV. This was at 10 years old, and whoever said it said that even at that age, he had this quality that we seem to be talking about. Well, it wasn't me that said or wrote that. Whoever did, though, captured it just right, because I have heard that said about this uh, young man. Let's hope he never loses it, and yeah. let's hope that... Uh, uh, we as a game uh, don't don't place the expectations so terribly high because sometimes uh, they can suffocate you. And, and I'll I'll remind your listeners: not so long ago, there was a very youthful, innocent young man named Sergio Garcia who ran up the fairway at uh, Medina, and all of a sudden he was the next big thing, and he was going to win a lot of majors. And I, I think the weight of expectations has. Uh, held Sergio back considerably and from time to time made him a not-so-pleasant guy to be around. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, one thing I think Jordan does have in his favor, and uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about this last night, um, and that is that when you look at the people that he was around, uh, you know, he was with Nicholas on um, uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, I played a practice round with Ben Crenshaw. He's being kind of shepherded and mentored in a way, if you will, by some people who've who've really got the best interest of the game at heart. And I think one of the things they may be doing is kind of taking some of those edges you're talking about and just making sure that there's steerage going on, if that makes sense. I, I, I am aware of that, and I think it's great, especially the, the University of Texas connection uh, mm -hmm. to, to Crenshaw. Who, who, what better mentor could you ask for than uh, Ben Crenshaw? Right. Yeah, it's great. I loved in uh, Global Golf Post, you mentioned about Tiger not being there. And one of the things, uh, one of the reasons I'm glad you're on, obviously, is to alert people who have not become as familiar as they hopefully will be with Global Golf Post. But I love that you had... Um, Senior correspondent John Hopkins, uh, who has such an amazing record of writing for the Times of London, the Sunday Times, and is now one of your wonderful stable of writers. But the piece, uh, he has a book that just uh, came out. And, um, you know, five years ago, he did a piece on why he thought Tiger was not going to catch Jack. And I thought it was great. It was, a, it was a wonderful read and obviously made me just want to run out and buy the book as well. But I thought it was pretty timely to have that in there now. Well, John, John was, you know, uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, before it became more obvious that Tiger's going uh, to struggle to catch or to pass Jack. Um, 
uh, he he wrote it and he didn't back down from it, and he still hasn't. Uh, and I think the events of, of the last couple of years have have served to uh, validate John's point of view. Uh, it was said a little bit more brusquely once uh, by the great Dan Jenkins when he was asked about the chase for eighteen. He said he'll get there if he doesn't get a bad back or a bad marriage. Well, in Tiger's case, he got both. Leave it to Dan Jenkins. <laughs> Boy, that's perfect. Um, we're talking about the, the nature of the writing uh, in Global Golf Post, and I want to get to to starting out um, what you did. But when I look at the people who you have and who've been put together uh, on the staff of Global Golf Post and the, the logistics, I had Mike Perky was on the show, and we talked about the logistics of putting together uh, this amazing piece of digital machinery that comes to us from around the world, literally in the correspondence in different places, uh, and what the whole process is like. But the people that you have in place from Editor-in-Chief Brian Hewitt to Executive Editor Mike Perkey, you've got Art Spander, uh, Martin Kopelian's in there, who's, by the way, did a great piece, I thought, also in the wrap-up yesterday on Oliver Goss, the low amateur at the Masters. Thought that was fantastic. Um, to everybody that's in there, Ron Green Jr., um, who I'm lucky enough to have known for a long time because I lived in Charlotte, and, and he's another one that I look forward to reading all the time that now people have access to uh, on that level, thanks to you. Do you... Tell us a little bit about... I know it was 2008. The world was spinning. Uh, things were crashing all around everybody, and uh, Jim Nugent took that opportunity, from what I understand, to, to have an idea to do something a little bit different. Tell us about that time. Well, it, the world was spinning out of control. It's a good thing I didn't know it. Because, uh, I, I might not, if, if I was uh, smarter, I might not have tried to, to launch this venture when the world had fallen apart. But, you know, if you, if you step back from the, the financial mess that was going on and, and just looked at what was happening in the digital world and looked at how the digital transformation was changing all of our behavior as consumers and how that was likely to impact uh, print, be it newspapers or magazines, it seemed to me that there was uh, an opportunity to create something like Global Golf Post. And the first audience I had to convince uh, were investors, and I was reasonably successful in, in doing that to get uh, to raise enough capital to launch the business. But the next audience I had to convince were some of the very names that you talk, uh, that you just rattled off. So Brian and Mike Perkey uh, and Barton Kallian and uh, at the time, Laleen Mayer and, and John Hopkins over in the U.K., and then ultimately Ron Green came to, to join us. I still pinch myself from time to time when I look at the Masters and look at the quality, the reputation, the, the brands of, that these people represent, what they have already contributed to this game with their words. Uh, I'm so very, very fortunate and blessed to, to think they would uh, buy into the idea that I had. But more importantly give the idea life, to give it soul. Uh, there are a lot of good ideas out there. Some succeed, some fail. This idea appears to be working because of the uh, words that these great writers have, have uh, brought to golfers. And, and again, I am very, very fortunate, and I, I think our game is benefiting from it as well. I do, too. You, you launched in 2010, and now, I mean, you really have set the bar. I know I was reading and doing some research, and you said something like, you know, once we've established and once we do what we're going to do, uh, we will not be the only game in town. The ones who go first always have the most difficult road. Uh, now it's kind of uh, picked up some steam in other areas. And what do you see as, as the future? Are there plans to uh, just kind of keep at it? Everything changes so fast now. I'm interested to hear if there's anything in the works, if you see things uh, expanding. I know you've got hundreds of thousands of, of people who appreciate it every week in uh, North America, in the U.K. I know globally, obviously, it's Global Golf Post. But uh, what kind of plans are there? Is there a way to kind of stay ahead of this curve? Well, there, there is a category growing up around us, and uh, we're, we're, we think that's a very good thing, first of all, that uh, uh, our game is, is, is going to participate in the uh, digital uh, revolution and not try and uh, resist it. Um, we're going to continue to focus on delivering high-quality uh, journalism, uh, but we're going to take a, a very, very much a global 
uh, perspective on it. So what, what you may not know and many of your listeners may not know is that we do have a, an American edition, uh, but we also have a Canadian edition. And we publish a third edition every week uh, that serves the uh, European golf community. Uh, that edition is just now starting to get some traction, so I think there's considerable upside as far as both readership and our, our commercial activity with our European edition. Uh, we have our eyes on uh, the continent where the game is, is starting to really take root in a couple of places. We're going to uh, expand our coverage uh, into South Africa. Uh, we have our eyes on Australia. And then there's this great big continent called Asia uh, where the game is just getting started, and, and somehow we want to be a part of that. I don't know how and I don't know when, but uh, we're not going to ignore what's happening over there. That makes sense. So if, if I want to look to the future, maybe I'll just start going online and learning Chinese and Korean and a whole bunch of other languages. Well, that's our challenge. Uh, the, the continent that's called Asia really is, is something that only means uh, something to, in geography class. What you have is a lot of different nations with different cultures and different languages. Uh, and so it's not, uh, you can't say that you're going to have an Asian edition. You need to address uh, the Japanese market, then the Korean market, and then the Chinese market, and the Southeast Asian marketplace. So it's, it's a, a challenging um, uh, situation, but uh, a, a huge opportunity if, if we can figure it out. Um, let's uh, just jump ahead quickly. We've got great events coming up. The, the men are in uh, Hilton Head this week. The women are on the move. Everybody's kind of really getting into it now that the Masters has happened. We've had the first major on the women's tour. Um, the two U.S. Opens that are coming to Pinehurst, uh, is that a challenge for you guys, or is it good that they're both in the same spot and you can kind of hunker down for a couple of weeks and, and just put together what I think is going to be just a phenomenal time at Pinehurst in 2014? We think it's going to be a little bit easier. It's, it's certainly going to be two long weeks, and it's going to be two long weeks in a climate that's uh, not going to be 70 degrees and, and breezy. Um, but, you know, we'll be able to stay in the same area and not have to get on airplanes and be able to in the same home. Uh, for that, that uh, fortnight. I think it's uh, a, a great idea. I hope that the weather cooperates. I applaud the USGA for thinking a little bit differently here. I think we have uh, an opportunity in this fortnight to call attention to uh, elite golf for both men and women, draw some interesting distinctions and comparisons. Uh, I think it's going to be spectacular. I just hope that Mother Nature cooperates. Well, we're all putting a word in in advance, and hopefully... A couple months from now, we'll get the results we all want. I can't thank you enough, again, not just for myself, but for all of us who love the game, for uh, everything that you've done and are doing to... to and again, I, I, I repeat, one of the things I love is that I have learned so much about areas other than the men's and women's tour on the pro level, because I think so often the, the news about all golf and the different people who play it around the world can get lost in the culture of, of hype. And what you do for the game in terms of junior golf and amateur golf and the stories relative to that side of it, to me, is just a, another great aspect of the Global Golf Post. And, and I can't thank you enough for that. And, and for spending a few minutes, I know it's been, like I said, a couple of hectic weeks on your end, and I hope you enjoy some R&R, &R and, and maybe we can catch up again at some point in the future. But thanks again for all you're doing, Jim. We really appreciate it. Well, again, you're, you're very kind, and I'd love to join you and your listeners anytime. So thank you for having me on. Okay. Thanks. Have a great, great week. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. There he goes, Jim Nugent. Uh, and again, from an idea in 2008 to what we love now and really look forward to, the Global Golf Post, if you haven't gotten it, it is the easiest thing that you can imagine to do. You just go online, you find it, you subscribe, it's free. Uh, and Monday morning, when you wake up, in your inbox, it will say Global Golf Post. You click on it. It is. They have done an amazing job across all platforms. I was thinking about this this morning. Across all platforms, it's so easy to navigate back and forth through the pages. Uh, it's just, it's beautifully done. Jim has done a great job of putting together an amazing team. So thanks to him for joining us for a few moments as we wrap up what has been, for me, one of the 
most exciting months that I've had on a month of Masters. Uh, I think hopefully all of you have learned as much as I have and what's exciting is because of the success of a month of Masters, we are going to be doing the same thing on Golf Connections for each one of the majors. We'll start with both U.S. Opens. Uh, we'll have a month dedicated solely to both of those events. Then we'll move to the Open Championship uh, which obviously comes in July. The PGA Championship is at Valhalla in August uh, and the Ryder Cup this year in September at Glen Eagles. So we've got months coming up in a row for all of you out there with what I hope will be interviews that you don't really get to hear anyplace else but right here on Golf Connections. And I'm grateful to uh, everyone for listening and to enjoying it along with me. I learn as much as anybody by doing these, and I hope you do too. So thanks for being with us for a month of Masters presented by East Coast Golf Management. Uh, next week, Golf Connections once again will roll on, and we hope you'll be with us for that. I am Mitch Lawrence, and as Billy Mack takes us away for one last time this month with Augusta, sweet Augusta, I'll remind you all that Golf Connections is produced and broadcast by the Zeus Radio Network for thegolfdirector.com. So long, everybody. Then came Palmer, Player, Watson, Nicholas, till Seve led the coup.